All right, I think I'm going to jump right in. Um, in the acknowledgments page of um, a book I wrote called Vital Signs, the last but not least entry is an acknowledgement of my mother for being a consummate role model in living a passionate life and for always giving me lots of material to write about. <laughs> um, but there's a postscript to this acknowledgement that I want to share because it has everything to do with my personal interest in the subject of passion. And that is that in the last 20 or more years of my mom's life, starting roughly in her early 60s, her get up and go, as they say, got up and went. All right, her life force, her mojo, her vitality, her spark. Um, I think it was a combination of a certain amount of neglect and a certain amount of the law of entropy. All right, and what that tells us is that systems tend to lose energy over time unless you pump more energy into the system. All right, so uh, a hot cup of coffee is going to cool down unless you reheat it. Right? Um, clock is going to wind down unless you rewind it. Oatmeal is going to congeal if you stop stirring it. All right? As will marriages. <laughs> um, and my mother just quit stirring the oatmeal. She just slowly opted out of active engagement in life, which is really what I think um, passion is ultimately about. And not just a passion, but passion as a skill all right, as a mindset, a stance that you take toward life, okay? So um, what clued me into this was a conversation that she and I had just a few years ago. She, um, she had been at loose ends for uh, at least 20 years about how to spend her time since retiring from being a stockbroker on Wall Street. And one afternoon, very uncharacteristically, she asked me, what I thought she should do with her time, all right? So I made suggestions. I said, well, what about taking some art classes? Um, she said, oh, I, I did that already. I mean, as if art is something you do once and check off a list. <laughs> I said, how about one of those music appreciation courses at the university that'll take you on field trips to the symphony and the opera because she wasn't driving anymore. Um, and she said, oh, those are for old people. <laughs> She's like in her 80s at this point. Um, I said, uh, what about a trip? I know you can't do the, the uh, adventure travel anymore, but how about a barge trip in Provence or a cruise up the inside passage or something like that? At least you'll get out of Dodge. And she just said, nah. Um, how about volunteering with SCORE? You know, this Service Corps of Retired Executives National Mentoring Program? I said, you have so much incredible experience um, that you could be passing along to people coming up through the ranks behind you. Um, what about that? And to which she remarked, oh, please, volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> she actually said, yeah. That counts for absolutely nothing on a resume. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, what would you say? I said, Mom, you're 82 years old. Are you still building your resume? <laughs> wow. I mean, you're still climbing the corporate ladder? Not that you should ever give up the good fight, but seriously. And what I, what I realized in that moment was that I had to give up my good fight. All right, this is the one where I had, as I had for 20 years, more than 20 years before that, where I was trying to encourage her, inspire her, cajole her, nag her to take on some new challenges, to make some new friends, to get out of the house, submit herself to some of the deeper calls that come in this later phase of life just to re-engage with the world and come back to life after what I perceived to be the dual demotivators of retirement and a second divorce. Or as she put it at one point, nobody to do it for anymore, which is a really revealing comment. 
nobody to do. And maybe a lot of people have this experience, maybe especially at retirement, that you realize you have a radioactive core of depression inside of you that was just being held in check all of those years by, you know, the cooling towers of busy lives, okay? And when those busy lives stop or even slow down, the depression comes to the fore, all right? Maybe a lot of people discover this. So uh, my mother just lost the will to participate, to explore, to create, and to contribute, especially. All right? She just stopped investing herself in life, stopped investing in herself, which is a pretty strange thing to say about a stockbroker. <laughs> um, you know, she, she just, and, and as it turns out, and I learned the hard way, you cannot make somebody do that. Right? Um, you cannot undo the spells that people put on themselves. Even if you're Mr. Callings and your own mother is throwing your game all off. You know? So I wondered, of course, how does this happen? How does it happen that people lose their appetite for being in the game? All right? Even people with a lot of life force. How does passion turn into dispassion and boredom and resignation and just time being torn off the calendar unused and of course how do you stop the slide all right so I know this I know that um, passion comes and goes you know it comes and goes there's no such thing as a life of passion any more than there's a perpetual motion object you know, it's, it's a sine wave. It comes and goes, and we have to ride it out to some degree. And occasionally, of course, reboot. All right? Um, I also know that life is perfectly capable of knocking the stuffing out of people. You know, again, even really strong people with all of its uh, demands and its disappointments and its numbing routines. And if you're one of those people that's just trying to keep your chin above water, you know, just trying to get by day to day to day, maybe it's asking a lot to also kick up your heels. <laughs> you know? Um, how many of you guys have seen a movie, uh, the movie Dead Poet Society? Ring a bell? So you'll recognize this. I actually heard somebody say this. She said, I have a carpe diem mug. <laughs> and truthfully, at 6 a.m., the words do not make me want to seize the day. She said, they make me want to slap a dead poet. <laughs> so, there's that. Um, and I know that there's a clue in there when she says there's nobody to do it for anymore. Because psychologists talk about what they call primary and secondary motivation. All right? Primary motivation means you're doing something because you love it. Whatever it is, in whatever arena. You're doing it for the charge of it, for the challenge of it. All right. Secondary motivation is you're doing it for a payoff. All right. Um, a paycheck or um, power, sex, influence, fame, whatever. And there's a pretty simple test to determine which one of those two is in the driver's seat. And that is that if and when the payoffs dry up, do you still do the work? Right. Are your passions still intact? All right. Um, my, my point is that it's occasionally tragically easy to let our vitalities just slip away, to lose our sense of um, enthusiasm, our sense of energy, to say nothing of purpose and direction, and in any arena, all right, vocational, but also relational and um, uh, creative and spiritual, just to... Um, lose our sense of wonder, all right? Our sense of wildness, adventure, novelty, discovery, self-expression, right? To just let them slide into disuse or, or, or get siphoned from us by just all manner of downward pulling forces that are just simply part of life. Stress, 
um, boredom, um, fear, routines, responsibilities, to say nothing of things like a great recession and living in a code orange world, <laughs> you know? Um, it's actually a phrase I pick up at the airports. We're on code orange, all right? You know, I mean, it's no wonder people want to batten their hatches. In fact, um, it strikes me sometimes that life is so full of deterrence to passion and energy and enthusiasm and self-expression and authenticity that what we casually refer to as normal behavior is really a state of arrested development. <laughs> it's just so pervasive we don't even notice it. Like, I'm in the, I'm in the uh, grave, the, um, the cemetery around the corner from my house recently, and I notice a gravestone for a W.C. Stradley, and his epitaph said, he lived a spotless life, a triumphant death. <laughs> and I sat in front of it for a really long time, just, a spotless life? I mean, I would much rather have this the other way around. <laughs> you know, a triumphant life, a spotless death. <laughs> this works for me. Um, I'm just saying that a spotless life, my God, this does not strike me as something to aspire to. You know, I think if we don't leave this life with a few good grass stains on our pants, you know, and a few really good stories to tell about our skirmishes with the seven deadlies, we've missed the boat. If not the point, which is not to rise above it all, not to wear our Sunday best all week, it's to sink your teeth into it. Just let it drip down your chin. You know? Here, this will scandalize some of you. Um, I've got a fr friend who's got a poster on the wall in her kitchen that shows a picture of a woman down on her hands and knees scrubbing out a bathtub. Okay? And the caption says, a clean house is the sign of a wasted life. <laughs> okay. In, in, which case, in which case, I'm doing great. <laughs> so here's a few things I want to share with you about how to get it back. To whatever degree you may feel that you've lost a sense of your energies and your vitalities and your life force. And, um, here, number one, um, passion can, in fact, be cultivated. Okay, it can be turned on as well as off. This is not one from the either you've got it or you don't department. Okay, and I think that the cultivation of it happens most readily at the level of the gesture, the moment, you know, the decision, the, you know, the spontaneous action, not the five-year plan, the, the extreme makeover, <laughs> you know. Um, I think that's really where it happens. I'm, I'm, I had a conversation with a bunch of friends one evening um, not too long ago, and at one point, one of the guys said, you know what the problem is? We're not outrageous enough. And I said, so what, what would you do if you were going to be more outrageous? And he thought for a moment, and then he reached up, and he swept his hair from middle parted and slicked back to side parted with a cowlick dangling over his forehead. I mean, just like instantly transformed him from Richard to Ricardo. You know, PhD to matinee idol. And, uh, and he said, he said, I would come into work like this. And I love that because I think that what he's getting at and what I try to get at, say, in my workshops is uh, what we're looking for is the subtlest impulse to express yourself and act on your passions and your authenticities and your, you know, your intensities. The subtlest impulses to do that. So what we're looking at, and build on that, of course, but what you're looking for is little switches in the course of any given day, little moments of choice that will take you either toward or away from your sense of aliveness. All right? So that's number one. Number two, passion is in the risk. All right? I think passion is in the risk, meaning um, the willingness to step from the sidelines onto the playing field. So the act of courage itself, even one step 
beyond the familiar. We'll typically kickstart it. All right. Um, how many of you guys have ever seen a movie called We Bought a Zoo? Does that ring a bell? We Bought a Zoo? So this is apparently based on a true story about a family that bought a zoo. Okay? And uh, in the movie version of this, the protagonist, who's played by Matt Damon, says to one of the other characters at some point, all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage, and I promise you something great will come of it. Isn't that fascinating? 20 seconds of insane courage. All right? Um, so, as opposed to the New Yorker cartoon that I saw recently, it's a picture of a man standing over his cat, and there's a litter box over here, and he says, don't ever, ever think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to that. So my point is that the, 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 the horse and cart equation is not necessarily that you identify a passion or a path and then start taking risks on its behalf, but sometimes by taking risks, by stepping beyond the comfort zone a little bit, you begin to clarify what they even are, okay? Uh, I did a consultation with a guy two years ago who said in the consultation that he was waiting for absolute clarity <laughs> before he would act on this song. Absolute clarity? Wow. Um, I mean, so here's a guy who's waiting for all his proverbial ducks to be lined up which I think happens roughly around the same time the cows come home, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I said to him, I said, maybe the, the kind of clarity you seem intent on finding, you might only find by taking action. You know what I'm saying? You might. Um, so, and risk, of course, by the way, is utterly relative. This is not a comparison game. Risk is what scares you. Okay, and it's not necessarily the big scary stuff like jumping out of airplanes or, you know, traveling the world solo or starting up a new enterprise or something like that. Much closer to home. Like, take your jokes or your poems to open mic night. You know, be the first to make up after a quarrel. Okay, that's risk. Um, make love with the lights on. <laughs> your eyes open. You know, when somebody asks you how you're doing, tell them how you're really doing. You know? Doesn't that, you don't have to make a federal case out of it, but be honest. Tell them how you're really feeling. That's a risk. All right? Um, say yes to something you habitually say no to. Right? Or say no to um, something you've been putting up with for too long. You know? Say no to something you've been putting up with. Um, or, or bundle some novelty into your days, because novelty is a corrective. And by the way, people who study this stuff seem to find that those who tend to thrive the most over the course of their life tend to score high in novelty seeking. Okay? But, uh, and start small. You know, get up on the other side of the bed than the one you always get up on in the morning, right? Or, or sit at a different side of the breakfast table than the one you always sit at. Don't you always sit in the same place, pretty much? A quarter turn to the left or the right and the whole view changes, <laughs> right? Um, that's novelty. Uh, drive to work a slightly different route than the one you always take. Order something other than your usual at the restaurant. Buy something you've never bought before at the grocery store. Just rearrange a piece of furniture in your house. You know, just, just shake it up just a little bit, all right? Um, you know the name Abraham Maslow? Does that ring a bell? He's the guy who, among other things, many other things, um, this is psychology, he gave us the, the hierarchy of needs. It's a pyramid um, of human needs, the bottom of which was food, clothing, and shelter, and then belonging to a tribe, et cetera. At the very top was what he called self-actualization, okay? And so he's the guy who coined the term self-actualization and one of the founders of the human potential movement. He, Maslow himself said that Self-actualization, people who tend to self-actualize, meaning fulfill their potential, tend to make the growth choice over the fear choice every day. The growth choice over the fear choice. So that's a bar set pretty high. Um, reminds me of a conversation I had with a mentor of mine over lunch. 
I was telling him I was terrified of failing at an enterprise, which was quitting my job to be a freelance writer, all right? And um, I said, I'm just, I'm scared I'm going to fail at it. And his reaction to that was, Greg, if you are not failing regularly, you're living so far below your potential that you're failing anyway. <laughs> which explains why I had lunch with this guy maybe once a year. I mean, there's, there's mentors, and then there's tormentors. <laughs> Which is actually a good thing, because all that really means is somebody who's not afraid of making fun of the king or the queen, you know? They don't mind running tire tracks across your nice, neat suburban lawn. But these are good people, to, because they're not, you know, they're not just going to coddle you, they're going to push you out of the nest. And, and this is important. These are important people to cultivate. Number three, passion is not just exuberance, it's endurance, all right? Sometimes shoulder to the wheel, stamina, patience on the order of years, all right? Um, because if your creative inspirations or even your infatuations aren't balanced by good long hours at the workbench, they're not going to come to fruition as a rule. You, you know who Malcolm Gladwell is? Uh, Mr. wrote the book Tipping Point. I think it was in a book of his called Outliers, where he, he said that mastery in any field of endeavor requires a minimum of 10,000 hours of dedicated practice. Yeah. So here's the math on that. 90 minutes a day for 20 years. <laughs> or some variation. And, you know, most people would rather just like, I just want to skip ahead to the part where I'm awesome. <laughs> 10,000 hours. So how many of you have ever performed in a play? Show of hands. Performed in a play? So out of um, 100%, what percentage of your time was spent rehearsing compared to performing? Ballpark. 90. 90, 10? Does that sound? 80, 90? Right. Um, same thing with performing in a band, right? But I think it's largely passion that explains people's willingness to put up with that equation. <laughs> Practice the same lines, the same lyrics, the same chords for, for thousands of hours. I'm a lefty, I didn't do that right, it's this way. Um, you know, for thousands of hours, for the chance to go public with it a tenth of the time, that, that is passion, in my opinion, that, that does that. Um, I remember... You remember the Calvin and Hobbes? Yeah. <laughs> the cartoon Calvin and Hobbes. I remember one that I had on my bulletin board for a while. It was a picture of Calvin being, you know, and Calvin's like a seven-year-old kid or something. And he's being woken up for his second day of kindergarten. His mother shakes him, wakes him up. He rolls over and he groans. And he looks at her and says, what, again? <laughs> so... So, um, yeah, passion has real staying power, in my opinion. We, we tend to think of it as a very, very kind of inherently unstable element. You know, it's like you go to the periodic chart and you find passion prone to degrading quickly when exposed to commitment <laughs> or familiarity. But, um, you know, it's like we think of it like a, a, a booster rocket in the space program. It's going to launch you into outer space, but once the orbit's reached, it's going to fall away. That has not been my experience or my observation, right? Um, it has tremendous... In fact, one of my very first heroes in life was Scheherazade. Remember Scheherazade? She's the queen whose stories make up all the Arabian Nights. And, um, and uh, so... It took her a thousand and one nights to turn the sultan around, right? That's three years. That's staying power, all right? The passion to tell stories, the passion to, to save her life, her own life, all right? And I've got an acquaintance who told me years ago that he was once arrested at an anti-war sit-in and given a suspended sentence with 15 hours of community service, okay? And the judge said to him, you can do any kind of service you want, so when they let him out, he went right back to the sit-in. 
And he said, I was doing community service when they arrested me. You know, and I just love that. I think that's brilliant. And finally, number four, if we lack passion in our own lives, or for our own lives, our other relationships are going to be denied that energy. Our, our partnerships, our children, grandchildren, um, our students, our congregants, our uh, whatever communities we belong to, our colleagues are going to be denied that energy because passion breeds passion, all right? And disinterest breeds disinterest, all right? And starting with the one-on-one, -on -one, because one person following their sense of vitality can have a profound effect on the unfolding of other people's. And especially if you are in any position of leadership or stewardship, all right? By which I mean whether you're a parent, a teacher, a mentor, a minister, a manager, a coach, a counselor, a CEO, a politician, your passion is critical to their engagement. This is, I'm sure, why when I headed off to college, my dad's advice to me was don't take courses, take professors. Hmm. I'm sure that's why he said that, you know, take professors. And, um, and, you know, the mechanics of inspiration work as, as readily at the collective level as they do at the interpersonal level, right? Um, the Gallup Company, for instance, came out with a study, maybe some of you are familiar with this, um, 2012, worldwide survey, 142 countries. They found that on average, 80% of workers are either not engaged or actively disengaged. Worldwide. It's a little bit better in the United States, but not as much as you might think. 80% not engaged or actively disengaged. Not engaged means you're checked out, okay? Actively disengaged means you are busy acting out your unhappiness and your dispiritedness and spreading the virus around <laughs> among whoever happens to be in the vicinity. You know, um, that's pretty compelling. In fact, if you were to translate the numbers in this Gallup study into a metaphor, um, I'll give you an example of what they would mean. It means that if you were a member of a rowing team out on a river, one of your teammates, that's roughly the 13% who are, who are engaged, one of your teammates is rowing his or her heart out. Five of them are just taking in the scenery and two of them are actively trying to sink the boat. <laughs> and, you know, and it's interesting to me that there was not a category in that Gallup study for actively engaged, i.e. passionate. There was not even a category for that in the study. What is that? There's not, there were not enough people in that category to make it statistically significant? Which would be significant all by itself, right? So, um, I'm going to end with this. The, the point of this being that if dispassion is contagious, so is passion. You just have to catch it first before you can spread it. All right? You have to embody it. You have to live it out. Um, to whatever degree you're interested in sharing it with a community and inspiring a community. So, I'm going to end with this. Um, this is a little anecdote that comes from a Colombian novelist named Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Some of you may be familiar with um, Hundred Years of Solitude, um, General in His Labyrinth, beautiful novels. He describes a man who is trying to solve the world's problems. Bless you. And his little boy comes running into the room and asks if he can help. And the man is touched by the boy's concern, but he's impatient to get on with it. So he takes a map of the world and he rips it into little tiny pieces and he hands it to the boy and says, here, you can help by piecing the world back together. The little boy has no conception of what the world looks like, but he takes the pile of scraps off to his room, and two days later, he comes running back in. He says, Father, I've put the world back together. And all the little pieces of paper have been very meticulously taped back together. And the father is stunned. And he says, how did you do that? And the little boy turns the paper over and says, well, on the back was a picture of a person. I put the person back together and then I turned it over and the world was back together. 
I mean, that's just great anecdote. <laughs> so in the spirit of helping to put ourselves back together, if not the world that we live in, in our own worlds, um, I just want to say that the workshop this afternoon is a very hands-on opportunity to explore what, um, where passion is showing up in your life and where it's disappearing. This is not lecture format. This is experiential, just so you know. Um, so it'll give you a, a kind of a snapshot of the state of your own um, life force at the moment and what your vitality wants from you at this juncture. So what the, the question we're after is, what wants to emerge right now in your life? What is trying to happen? So I hope you'll come. And uh, thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you.